Welcome back to Capital Conversations. Joining us now on the program are uh, Laura Nevitt, who has worked as a campaign staffer and organizer for a variety of Democratic candidates, including Howard Dean's uh, presidential bid in 2004, mm -hmm. before the famous... Scream. Right. I was there for it. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and proudly identifies herself as a liberal feminist. Welcome yeah. to the program, Laura. Thank you. Mark Jenkins, who is the Independence Party chair, uh, chairman for the Independence Party of Minnesota. Yep. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And John Swan, who's a frequent blogger, and you can find him over at shotinthedark.info uh, and identifies himself as a center-right conservative. I would. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't want to, but uh, yeah, that's good. So we've got the liberal, the conservative, and the independent here tonight. Appropriately spaced. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and we'll referee. Awesome. So. <laughs> so the big news this past week uh, in Minnesota was redistricting, and so I want to hear how you think your party came out with this, or just maybe overall from all of you. Let's start with John. I, I think the uh, the end result was probably pretty fair to, to all parties concerned. Uh, it did pair a lot of legislators together. I believe 46 in all mm -hmm. ended up getting paired together. You know, uh, fr from our standpoint, uh, the only complaint I would have is the, the process and, and the way the districts have been designed. Uh, you know, the whole reason you take it out of the hands of the legislature is they don't look gerrymandered. And you have a lot of districts that are cutting across precinct lines, have multiple uh, cities in them, and they look like something of the product of, of being gerrymandered. I, I'm not accusing anyone of that, but uh, I live in, in what will be Senate District 49 in Edina. Uh, we were Edina and West Bloomington. We now have the parts of four cities. Uh, little chunks here, little chunks there. Uh, and it's one example of many that I, I, I don't think people will be very fond of uh, over the next 10 years. But do those city lines matter anymore? I mean, this, they, they kind of all bleed into each other suburbs-wise? or Well, to a certain extent, but if you're living in, say, uh, Maple Grove or Minnetonka, and you live on, on the edge of the city, but now you suddenly find yourself voting uh, in, in a you know, jurisdiction where it's a majority for several other cities, uh, it's hard to feel as connected. People don't get involved in the process if they feel like they're a very small chunk. Um, is it a major issue? You know, I don't think in the end, because again, I think the end result was probably fair to pretty much everyone. So, well, first of all, to, to address the gerrymandering the lines, um, there are states that have it much, much worse. One of my favorites is Arizona. If you step into the Colorado River in spots, you are actually in a different district than when you get out on the other side of the river. Um, so we're not that bad, but I do agree so with the- So you go in, I don't want to pick sides, but let's just say for, you go in as a dirty Democrat and you come out as a clean Republican. Is that what you're saying? Could be, could be. Or vice versa. <laughs> or you could go in a dirty Democrat, be be clean while you're in the water, and then Cleansed. get out on another, right. on the other or side. Vice versa. Because it's, not, because it's actually, because the- a natural boundary? No, no, no. The point is, the river is part of the district. So you're in District 1 on this side of the river, District 2 sure. in the river, District three when you touch shore on the other side. Oh, got it. We don't That's, like so that what we've got isn't odd. quite that bad. Probably the independent but has to stand in the middle somewhere where the water's rushing over. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> well, that was the clean part, right? I guess that's where we would be. No, but to go to, um, to, go to John's point, um, I ran for state senate in 2010, and I have to have had, at that point, one of the easiest districts to define because my district was Maplewood, Oakdale, and North St. Paul my Senate district followed those mm -hmm. boundaries. I didn't have to say I was Maplewood south of the railroad tracks, east of you know, White Bear and south of Larpenter, and have people you know, go, well, which side of Larpenter or that stuff. So to some degree, when you can keep the cities together, it makes it easier for both the voters and the right. candidates. But to your original point, for the Independence Party, redistricting years, you know, I mean, it's sort of a rebirth of the legislature. It's an excellent opportunity for us, no matter how you slice it. Um, open districts mean that there isn't an incumbent mm -hmm. we need to try to go in and unseat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a relatively level playing field for all three well, in parties case, in those Weaver cases. Will still be there, so. Actually, uh, Chuck will be in 43, 43 now, and I'm in 53, You're, because oh, so I'm in the infamous old. south leg yeah, of the leg. Maplewood. Okay. Sure. Um, and uh, by the way, no, I'm not running. Um, I get that question a lot these times. <laughs> but. Um, for us, open seats are a great opportunity. Um, having legislators paired against each other where mm. you've got 
two incumbents who both have to try to explain what happened at the state capitol. We can come in and be the voice of, well, we didn't like what either of you guys did necessarily. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunities for us. And right now, I'm going to say pretty safely, you'll see a much larger slate of Independence Party candidates this year than you have in the past. Well, let's follow up. But yeah. I mean, we'll get you, Laura. But um, do you have you identified people, or you're in the process right now? Based the answer would be yes happened? and yes. We've okay. got people that are lined up, and we've still talking to other people. Yeah, there's still people who are looking at the maps and talking to their friends and and their campaign teams to see, you know, whether they want to stay in this district. You know, do they want to go for the open house or the open senate? So, but uh, yeah, we're we're in the process. Okay. And Laura, your response to the redistricting, how does it look for the DFL? I think, I mean, I think I would just say what the same, I don't have any more really to add. I think um, more to your question about people not feeling like, you know, city lines don't matter. And I think they do. I think the biggest shift that, you know, that I paid attention to was this, you know, I live in the city, so it was a lot of friends that live in Minneapolis and the big shift of complete Senate districts moving, you know, an entire Senate district north from a party unit standpoint and, um, and uh, you know, people just kind of feeling like, you know, their whole world has kind of yeah, I saw some shifted, of that shifted. <laughs> on and Facebook. I, and I'm one of those, I, you know, I live in a precinct in St. Paul that I've been told, you know, is one of those precincts that every 10 years flips between districts and I flipped. And so Representative Murphy used to be my state ledge and now I'm, I'm having that like, oh, I've got a whole new world I've got to learn now mm -hmm. with the Senate district and who who's there and who are the people that are active and getting to know a whole kind of new crew of people. So, which is, I don't really mind because I, you know, I do a lot of campaign work so it's just kind of fun for me. But the people that aren't engaged in that, I think it, there is a bit of a, oh crap, you know. <laughs> I swear. Perhaps okay. Yeah, um, I can say that. <laughs> you know, just kind of, the, you know, we've already had precinct caucus and we've got to go into convention season and now all this big shifting and what's going to happen and, you know, it's a little undaunting. I think that, and that was just from the, I think the lateness of the maps getting released mm -hmm. um, didn't help sure. things. I think that we had seen them at the end of last year, even at the turn of the year, it would have been a little different, but to have them come out after precinct caucuses happened was a little tough. Yeah. So is there a, a better way to handle redistricting, do you think, or is a judicial solution the best one? I, I don't really have a, um, I, don't, I, I don't know that there's any better way to do it. I don't have a, a personal opinion one way or another about it. Okay. The party itself may. I don't. I don't. I don't want to speak for the DFL party. I'm not a officer. Mark, is there a better way to do it? I would say the best way was years ago when the legislature was actually able to disagree without being disagreeable and come to, you know, a consensus. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. What six of the last seven redistrictings we've had? Mm -hmm. it's been a so. Long time. 70 year history means, guess what? The original model, it probably isn't the best anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, I would support going to a straight, straight to judicial or to, um, you know, I would, I'd, I'd prefer judicial, but maybe a, you know, a committee of experts or task force or something. But I think it's time to take it out of the legislature's hands. They're just, you know, as with many things, pushing it, kicking the can down the road and letting someone else do the hard work. Uh, it's a sausage being made and no one likes watching it being done. So whether it's the legislature or, or the courts, if you actually watch the process, anyone's going to feel uh, a little disenfranchised, a little disappointed in it. Uh, I think the process we have now, for all of its flaws, does work to a certain extent because you allow the legislature, you allow the interested parties to come forward with maps and to have a say and then it goes into the courts and so we have at least uh, an idea of what people wanted and so people can say hey you know you got some of what you wanted you didn't get some of what you didn't mm -hmm. if we went into this completely blind I think people would be a lot more nervous at least the people like us who are very interested in mm -hmm. politics knowing you know where are we gonna end up how is this gonna go and people wouldn't be able to claim some victory out of the process yeah, but I would think if we had a judicial process it's not to say we would ignore the parties and ignore the existing process no. but maybe we would get it done Oh, on time? <laughs> um, one of Common Cause's uh, complaints about this process was that there really weren't public hearings or people didn't really, there were some, but not as many as they would have liked and, and that people didn't, just average citizens didn't have a chance to weigh in. Did any of you get that sense from? Yeah, I think there was certainly a sense from 
um, you know, people that are very active in the political process, whether it be advocacy or they're here lobbying or they're just active in their communities. There definitely was a, you know, I, I heard a lot of grumblings about feeling like there were more places they had wished there were more places where they could have come and, ha you know, got to say something. You know, we have with the light rail, there were, you know, bazillions of times you get to come and have an input and that's put into the report at the end and, you, you know, at least you feel like you got to have a say in what was going on and that didn't really happen here. And I, um, I think there was some, you know, people that were a little miffed by that. I don't think it was a huge, overwhelming, you know, I'm going to, you know, take it out on whatever, but um, mm -hmm. there, I definitely think there was a sense of Minnesota has a, a great history of um, progressiveness and political activism and, and, and working with its citizens, and it didn't really happen here this time. John, you, you were shaking disagree? Your head. Yeah. Yeah, you Oh, well, I, not uh, significantly. I would say I think there were forums, there were opportunities. I think redistricting is one of those areas that we tend to forget. Um, we are the 1% of, of, you know, in terms of being interested in politics. Uh, the vast majority of the public doesn't understand redistricting, and even though I think we could maybe do a better job of educating people, I really doubt there's a huge level of interest. I mean, mm -hmm. I know people who are very involved, as uh, and all of us here do, who <laughs> quite honestly forgot we were having to go through this process, who don't know how the process works, and they've been involved for... Well, it only pops up once every 10 years. Well, yeah, so exactly. Like, so at the end of the decade, you're like, Oh, the biennium, we're in the middle of biennium. Oh, it's an election year. Wait, wait, <laughs> redistricting's on the, you know, wow, who, who came up with that? Yeah. All right, well, so now we're going to have... Well, what? I, I want to disagree sort of about here. Um, it, in the metro area, there were plenty of opportunities. I was at most of them. Now, to some degree, I'm sorry, to disagree with John, the rooms were standing room only, so people are engaged. Now, it wasn't, you know, the Metrodome. It's not no, like, no. you know, there was a million people there. But there is a group of people that is aware and it's mm -hmm. important to them. Now what I can't say is I live in the Twin Cities and unfortunately sometimes our political system tends to be Twin City centric. I believe there were only five total judicial hearings and two of them being in the metro area, it may have been fine for those of us in the metro, but I can't say that the people in Tofte or Bawabek or War Road really had a chance to voice their opinion. Mm -hmm outside of, you know, maps they could submit and stuff like that. Right. Well, so the people out there in Bawabek and uh, Hibbing, you get mm -hmm. active. <laughs> well, I'm sure they are. I'm just well, joking. No, but you just shut up. You can tell us how you feel. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay, so now we're going to have elections this fall. Um, can each of you tell me what are some of the issues that are, are going to bring people to the polls from your respective parties? Um, Laura, I, I think the number one... Um, issue is the marriage amendment. Um, just the idea of putting discrimination into our constitution is um, offensive to a lot of people. I, um, and I think that's going to drive out um, folks. I think it's picking up a lot of momentum on people that are, are against the amendment. And you're seeing a lot of across the board coalition building going on that's not with traditional democratic leading groups that are supporting it. Um, you're seeing a lot of churches and businesses and school independence parties. Independence parties. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, I think mm -hmm. it's something um, that's just, people are really starting to understand that, bec you know, someone's sexuality shouldn't have to do with whether or not they can get married or not. And, and your party's already taken a position on it. It's yes, we've, yep. we joined the coalition really early, I want to say within the first few weeks. And just to clarify for our viewers, what side of the issue does the IP party stand on this? So the Independence Party stands very strongly in support of Minnesotans United for All Families um, in our work to defeat the marriage amendment um, on the books. Now, one of the nice things about this coalition is there are several reasons to defeat this amendment. And our reason may be a bit different than some of the other constituencies we have in this coalition. Um, for us, it's not a matter that we endorse gay marriage, it's a matter that we don't think the state should be legislating morality. And there's a, a very supportive group of Republican um, mm -hmm. legislators and activists who stand side by side with us on that point. Um, you know, if when the amendment is defeated, will some of the um, organizations maybe introduce marriage equality legislation? Possibly. And mm -hmm. we'll politely stand on the other side of the aisle and say, 
No, that's still legislating morality. Well, John Swan, if Minnesota defeats that, it, it'll be the first state that's, that's done it. Mm -hmm. So wh where do you think conservatives, I mean, obvious, be beyond the rhetoric, beyond all that, right. is there a division in, 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 with some Republicans in regard to the, their marriage amendment? Where, where do you think that's at? You know, I think there is always, with any political party, you're going to have people on different sides of the issue. I, I think it, what it really gets down to, though, Marty, um, if you want to talk about any sense of division, it's where are we having this debate versus where do we actually want to be? Is this really an issue of protecting marriage or is this an issue of defining rights? I think if this was an issue solely of defining rights, we could have probably solved this a, a long time ago with things like civil unions and the like. And, and I know that's not a bar that's far enough for, for many people. At the same time, it takes the, the word marriage that has a connotation as a religious institution and it takes it off the table, which takes a lot of the polarization off the table, and it gets it into, you know, I think most people would say, do we want to make sure that uh, gay and lesbian couples have some recognition by the state, have some protection by the state for their relationship? That isn't fundamentally what I know a lot of conservatives, even conservatives who support the amendment, have a problem with. They want to make sure that marriage, that term, is reserved for between a man and a woman. Well, and that's our position is it should be also reserved for the religious institution that that family mm -hmm. attends. But this amendment is trying to define it from a political governmental role and mm -hmm. take that definition away from the religious community. And that's why we oppose the amendment as it stands. Well, I would say government, frankly, has forfeited its right and its role being in marriage in the first place. Once we adopted no-fault marriage, it's become a contract. I mean, I, I hate to uh, bring it down to that, but the state is basically just, you know, saying, okay, the two of you have made an arrangement, you can break it apart at any time. So already I think this, the government's role in terms of marriage is already a, a far less than what it was 40, 50 years ago. So, so that justifies us just continuing down that path. Well, I think that that's fine by me as far as I'm concerned, but that's not the, perhaps the role of everyone. <laughs> I'm going to let you two battle it out. <laughs> well, um, that seemed like it was going to be a good argument, and then it just kind of fizzled. Don't let me stop you guys. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll keep that in mind next time. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of marriage amendment. Well, I mean, not marriage amendment, uh, amendment issues, and uh, we talked to Representative Abler and uh, Murphy about that earlier. But there's the right to work. We've got you know supermajority, possibly the voter ID, which seems to have a lot of support if you if you look at the polling data. Um, Democrats, in large measure, are against that. Uh, um, but uh, here at the State House, we, we've just got about eight minutes left. We've got to cover a lot of ground if we want to get to it all. So let's start and, and, and be brief. Where are you at, John? And what do you think about those amendments? And uh, I'll shut that up. I, I apologize. I think voter ID will probably end up finding its way onto a ballot. I think the rest of it will probably get tabled. It's an election year. Uh, voter ID, both from a public standpoint, from a political standpoint, it's more of a winner. Everything else, I think, is is a little more fraught with peril. So yeah, we'll politically. come back to that in a second. But it seems like uh, some have said, some anal analysts and pundits have said that if that voter I if voter ID makes that's one thing, but if the work right to work legislation comes up as an amendment, that would drive a lot of Democrats to the polls and, and probably galvanize even more. So, okay, anyway, they might drive some union money to the to the elections too, so <laughs> that's dangerous. Now, um, the Independence Party, each of those issues have their pros and cons, but what you know, the Independence Party strongly believes is we shouldn't be doing... You know, you somebody's know, out there cutting that sound bite right now, Mark, so I'll just give you an opportunity to rephrase that. You're saying union money in elections is dangerous. That's I'll stand by that. Okay, yeah. all right, no problem. <laughs> well, that's what sure. I heard. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard too. I just want to make sure that's your that's your statement. All right, no, no problem. Remember, we're the no pack, you know, party. Oh, I know. Yeah. You know. Well, we should talk. We're also the debt free. Finance, yeah, we're also the say, debt free yeah. party as well. But now, to to your question, um, hey, we you don't guys believe in. Be in debt. You don't have any money. Jeez. Hey, we have no, five. We we have five thousand dollars in the in the black. We're five hundred and five thousand dollars wealthier. Cushions at home. Five well, grand. well <laughs> then, well, Ken I Martin wish. would like no. 500,000 yeah, exactly right. of that. I wish. <laughs> um, no, but our point is we shouldn't be doing bread and yeah. butter legislation with the Constitution. Right. You can be on one side or the other of those issues, yeah. but the Constitution isn't Why where you should be doing that. And, and that's our point yeah. is 
this is abdication of both parties, to be honest, but I will lean a little bit heavier towards the Republicans. They can't get it past Governor Dayton. They'll say that the people chose. Well, no, the people chose them to write legislation that would get passed, and this is their way to try to abdicate that responsibility. Well, in fairness, maybe there are some issues that are bigger than the governor and the legislature and to put them to the vote of the people. But most of these aren't those issues. Fair enough. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Go ahead. I would think um, any addition of constitutional, constitutional amendments onto the ballot um, are going to drive out Democratic voters. Most of the ones that are proposed are pretty adamantly opposed by most Democrats, so just piling them on is just going to, you know. Laura, do you think any any of these amendments will make it to the ballot? I mean, of the supermajority, the voter I ID? I think the that? voter ID um, probably has the best shot of making it. I'm not okay. very sure where the other ones are at, um, but two amendments on the ballot that are both pretty divisive Okay. Um, discriminatory pieces of legislation are going to mm -hmm. drive out pretty active Democrats to vote on top of a presidential year where they you know, want to re-elect their president. So. Our producer Catherine just told me we lost connection for a minute on live stream, but we're back now, so sorry, we apologize for the interruption. We're glad you're back with us. Thank you, uh, Catherine. So let's get, so we've been talking about constitutional amendments, so let's talk about legislation. Uh, one piece of legislation that was passed yesterday in the Senate was this um, kind of uh, reforming the teacher tenure the system first in, in the, first out, right? the public schools. And the House of Representatives already passed legislation, so once they get together, it's on to uh, Governor Dayton. Do, um, do the Democrats, do you see, I mean, this is a big issue to the unions. Do, do you see Governor Dayton signing this? Do you see it's a good idea? I, I mean, I don't want to speak for the governor or his office in any way, shape, or form, but I don't imagine he would sign something that harms teachers. Um, he's a big friend of teachers and understands the importance of their role in our children's lives. And so I don't think that he would want to have anything to do with that. So I wouldn't imagine that it would, once it got to his desk, that he would, he would sign it. So. Well, I guess I don't see it as legislation that harms teachers because the bill doesn't fire teachers. It just helps define the selection process for when schools need to lay off teachers. Ideally, mm -hmm. the legislation never goes into practice because maybe the state starts to pay the schools back and they can afford to keep the <laughs> teachers they've hired. And then we don't ever have to put it into practice. Well, that's a but, whole other issue. <laughs> right. But okay, to say that this legislation right. harms teachers, I think, is one of those you know three bullet three word talking points that's there to scare up the voters when it really doesn't address the reality. I, I think Mark actually said it quite well. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think anything we can do to try and move towards a more merit-based system is uh, a, a positive step. But from a practical political standpoint, I mean, Mark Dayton isn't going to sign this. He's not going to you know, go against his own, the, the heart of his own constituency to do this. Um, does that make it an election issue? Uh, we'll have to see. I, I think that with so many other things on the table, it's probably going to get lost in the shuffle. But I would have to imagine it's going to get tabled, and we're going to see it brought up again in 2013, uh, quite if he, if he does veto it. Okay. Marty, you get to, oh, you want to do the Vikings Th one again? No, this is your <laughs> deal right here. Oh, uh, grades. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's assign some grades to the legislature legislature and the governor. Um, let's start with the legislature. What grade do you give to them and why this far into the session? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, sadly, I, I'm going to have to pass. I'm him. I don't have a grade. There's to no give. pass on I this don't program. have a grade to give them. You have to I'm, assign a grade. You I, know, yeah, I, work, I work more in campaign world and not legislative world. So, I, you know, I watch what they do. Come on, Laura. From take a, little a chance. Bit of, I, the I, dice, don't, I really, I really, I don't, I have not paid close enough so attention to. You don't think they get an A, do you? They, well, for sure not an A. I mean, okay. no legislation. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever right. give any legislator right. an A. But so we can eliminate the A. Yeah. Probably not uh, a B either. Uh, but I just haven't, you know, I, like I said, I pay attention to it peripherally. Right. I'm 
not not where I spend most of my time. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to pressure you. That's quite right. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Mark, you've got to have Mark, an opinion. you've got some grades, <laughs> man. <laughs> you I, I've got a couple in my head, and I just, you know, I don't want to repeat Mark Dayton's F grade and then have to remember that right. um, and defend it later, but it's definitely not a passing grade. Um, I mean, this is the same group of people that dragged our state into a special session and a shutdown, and now, because the state is cash flow positive for a few months. They claim we have a budget surplus and everything is good. So, you know, I think that's a bit delusional. So, mm -hmm. right. you know, they've been tackling, you know, you know, I'm waiting to see when we start talking about bonding. I, I've heard the word a little bit around yeah. here lately, but in a year when we have a budget surplus and we want to focus on jobs, what have we talked about? Amendments, marriage, and and we didn't you know. even talk about jobs. We and neither have jobs. they. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's, that's the problem. <laughs> but great, you know, it's great too Mark, early. Give us a grade. What do you think, legislature? There's a couple good things that have happened, so I won't give them an F. I will give them a D. It's not a passing grade to me. Fair enough, John. I'll give a legislature an incomplete because, like every legislature we've ever had, they save all their business to the very end, and we've had that with both parties. So they've really not done enough to have a grade, in my opinion. Um, and Mark Dayton is somewhat in a similar boat. I'd say absent. I mean, you know, he hasn't he hasn't come to class. He hasn't had to weigh in really on anything at this point. I was going to make a Vikings reference there. I mean, yeah. he's he's been somewhat he's been present for that issue, but kind of absent in terms of giving any further direction. Which actually, I'm frankly grateful for at this point because I don't want to see it happen. So no grade from you for the legislature or the governor, but you're going to say that they both get an incomplete. So far. All right. So again, Dayton. the other two parties are pushing it off, right. not taking yeah. responsibility. Well, we haven't, got, we haven't gotten to uh, yeah. Laura's A grade for Dayton yet. Okay, <laughs> we, have, we have ruled out A, but we still have an opportunity. No, I, I, uh, it, it's the, I would give a grade and an honest grade, if I, like I said, it's mostly if I am, my time is spent full time as a student these days, so paying attention to what the legislature and the governor are doing are not, just not my priority at the moment. So I read the blogs in the morning and I read the news, and um, um, but beyond that, I'm not, you know, well, you and, know and I get I, more highlighted about issues that, you know, I'm the president of the Feminist Caucus, so we had two abortion bills pass the Senate the other day. That yeah. I pay attention to. Sure. Um, that's not... But well, look, no, because, you yeah. know, Mark's the only one that's actually run for office, right? Yeah. Got, no. And he's the I only do. one... I run for office. You yeah. have run yeah. for yeah. office? Yeah. Well, congrats. I didn't know that. Well, and then the voters are better off than I lost. But Mark's that's... Very, <laughs> Mark's, are you running Mark's this the, year? <laughs> the polished politician, right. and he actually gave us a straight answer. I, well, where's the grades? Where's the... What are you going to give Dayton? You're, you're forced to give Dayton. There's a gun in here. What, what grade do you give him? I would probably give him a B. Okay. Laura gives Dayton a B. Dayton? C. C. C minus. It's a passing grade. All right. That's fair enough. All right. We'll come back to you at the end of the session. We'll, we'll, come, we'll <laughs> yeah. come back to you at the end of the session. But See, that's uh, why grades are dangerous. I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Don't hold it to exactly. <laughs> um, so. We're, we're, we've got a little weather segment coming up. We'll go to that. But, uh, uh, Andy, um, uh, did you have any other questions for our guests? <laughs> Put me on the spot, Marty. No. <laughs> well, all right. Well, yeah, I guess that's it I, for, for now. I mean, we could ask you. We could stay all night, but my producer's <laughs> telling us we got to wrap up. She's got a lot of work ahead of her. But, okay, so um, probably cutting out half my jokes. Why are you doing that? No, they're not very good, that's why. Hey, thank you for coming on, Laura. You're quite welcome. That's good. And if you want to learn more about Laura, you can go to, hang on, I got it here and I'm going to read it. <laughs> this wasn't my part, so. Uh, lololandlmn.blogspot.com. That's oh. L. Isn't it lololand up? underscore LMN? Is it? Yep. Don't forget that. Lolo, L-O-L-O -L -L -O -L land. Yes, that comes Underscore. from, I'm Auntie Lolo to my nieces. So. Auntie Lolo? Oh. I'm Auntie Lolo. I love that. LMN.blogspot.com. To see some of John Swan's work, you can check out shotinthedark.info. And you used to, be, uh, used to have your own blog, The First Ringer, right? Right. Okay. And you're a center-right conservative blogger. <laughs> Whatever we got. Don't try to box me, Marty. <laughs> you wore the Republican outfit, so I oh, put the well. red tie on. 
No, uh, and, it's and the only you, red tie I've got. <laughs> and, and you can learn more about the Independence Party Chair Mark uh, Jenkins at uh, I. Well, it used to be IP, but it's changed. It's Independence Party or Independence Minnesota. The easiest one is actually mnip.org. Mnip.org. All right. Yep. And and uh, for those that don't know it, the symbol for the Republican Party is an elephant. The de uh, Democrats. Donkey. The bison or buffalo. I did not know that. Did I did not, not know that either. Oh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> yeah, the bison. I, I was, that's that a was, great symbol. That's a good test too to know if you're really an IP yeah. person. You got to be able to answer that question. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for coming. You're Thank welcome. you for having me. Thank you. All right, we'll, we'll go to uh, Ethan's weather report uh, shortly, and we'll be back to wrap up the show right after that. Good day. This is Ethan's weather report. Today, it's 34 uh, degrees high. Low, 32 degrees. Rainy and snow. Um, what's the thing again? What about Wednesday? Wednesday, high, 36 degrees. Low, 27 degrees. And? S more snow. Correct. What's it going to be like Thursday, Ethan? Thursday, high, 37 degrees. Low, 16 degrees, pa partly sunny. Ah, okay. How about Friday? What's the weekend going to be like? Friday, high 32 degrees, low 27 degrees, C cloudy. That's really cool. How about Saturday and Sunday? Saturday and Sunday are really like 28 degrees high and 30, 30 degrees high and low 10 degrees and 30, 30 degrees low 12 degrees. And what's the, what's going to be like outside? Partly sunny, partly sunny. Okay, how about Monday next week? Monday, 39 degrees. Low, uh, 12 degrees. No, I think it's 30 degrees. Oh, 30 degrees. Right. Low, 30 degrees. Looks like we're in for a warm-up early next week. What about Tuesday, Ethan? Tuesday? I forgot it's sunny. Oh, right. Tuesday... High, 43 degrees. Low, 34 degrees. Sunny. That's all for my weather today. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us on Capital Conversations tonight. We'd like to thank our guests, Representative Aaron Murphy and Jim Abler. Also, political activists John Swan, Laura Nesbitt, and N Nevitt. Mark. Sorry, Laura <laughs> Nevitt, and Mark Jenkins. <laughs> From the IP. Yeah, and we had production assistance tonight from Susan Maracle and Connor Malloy. Our associate producers were Matt Ealing and Catherine Loudenslager. And her dad, the captain, sent a question, tweeted us a question last week. I didn't get to it, but I will get to it next week, I promise. Uh, and as well as uh, I'd like to thank uh, my co-host, Andy Friedel. And I'm Marty Owings. We'll see you guys at the Capitol. Good night. Mm -hmm.